Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over 20 years ago, as the new President of the Board of Trade, my first overseas visit to a major trade partner, Japan, was dominated by their most overwhelming concern. Business and politicians alike wanted reassurance that the then new Labour government would not be leaving the European Union. They were polite, but they were blunt. They had invested in the UK because the UK was in the European Union. And if we left, so would they. And just today, their ambassador re-emphasised their nervousness. So in 2016, I could foresee serious economic harm to Britain's interests. But I accepted that we had to abide by the referendum results and concentrate our energies on damage limitation. Despite mixed messages from the government, I voted to trigger Article 50 and the process of withdrawal. But frankly, since then, it's been downhill all the way. First, it became clear that those who'd clamoured for us to leave the European Union hadn't the faintest idea what to do next. There was no concrete plan for the nation's future, just a series of sweeping assertions about how easy, swift and painless leaving would be and that a golden future awaited us. Then we saw that the Prime Minister's decisions were being taken not in the best interests of the country, but to satisfy her Brexit extremists. The Withdrawal Bill then proposed that the control that we were taking should be returned not to Parliament, but to Ministers, with little, if any, real parliamentary scrutiny. Asserting Parliament's legitimate role has been an uphill struggle, as we saw in the most recent division today. Article 50 allows only a two-year window for negotiations, so I expected the Government to seek the fastest possible process, progress. I agreed with them that withdrawal and future partnership were best considered side by side. But when this was rejected, concluding negotiations on part one, the withdrawal agreement became all the more urgent. Leaving is one thing. What matters more is where you're going and on what terms. And that dialogue has yet to begin in earnest. If anyone had said that we would reach the end of our two-year window, struggling to reach any deal at all, I would never have believed it. But it's hard to negotiate successfully if you can't agree on what you want, willfully throw away your negotiating flexibility and sack people who tell you what you don't want to hear. Over these two years, while the government has wrangled endlessly about how to proceed, one disastrously unforeseen consequence of leaving the EU after another has been revealed. Members opposite keep insisting that everyone who voted knew exactly what they were doing and what the possible consequences would be. It may be so. All I can say is, I didn't. When I heard the Prime Minister pontificating about escaping the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, it never crossed my mind that that meant leaving your atom the watchdog not just for cancer treatment, but for the safety of nuclear power stations. And I know from ministerial experience that we have and have had for years a shortage of people across the world who have those skills and capacities, and we are about to leave behind some of those on whom we presently rely. Although whatever I didn't know, I did know how much we rely on Dover for our import and export trade. <laughs> Nor, Mr Speaker, had I focused on the losses to our scientific and medical research, or things like the Galileo product, project, and as each of these problems emerges, I keep hearing 
that it's all right because the government's going to continue all this investment, going, for example, also to support our farmers all on our own. So clearly, the Prime Minister's found another of those magic money trees. Much of our consumption, for example, our food consumption, relies on the frictionless trade that we now enjoy. So too does modern manufacturing. Key goods and components are perpetually whizzing round the European Union and back to the UK, and thousands of jobs across Britain depend on this just-in-time delivery. That's why I was appalled to hear the Prime Minister announce casually that Britain would leave both the single market and the customs union, and, what's more, that these were red lines. The economist, Professor Patrick Mintford, declared the other day that just as the Thatcher years saw the demise of major industries like coal and steel, so too, leaving the EU, which he nevertheless supports, will probably, and in my view disastrously, see the end of what's left of UK manufacturing. I know that, nevertheless, most of the business community urges us to vote for this deal, to provide the certainty that business always understandably seeks. I understand that totally. I have dealt with it for years. But no one should be under any illusions. These are not bluntly commitments to invest or stay in Brexit Britain. These are perfectly justifiable attempts to keep business going for the next two to three years, to give them a breathing space without disruption, to make their long-term decisions, which may not be in our favour. I recognise, too, the concern that staying in a customs union may restrict our ability to negotiate other trade deals, say, with the United States. Personally, I am not starry-eyed about such deals. For a start, it's frankly inconceivable that any American president, let alone this American president, would do a trade deal with the UK without making it a key condition that giant US health corporations be allowed unfettered access to our National Health Service. I can well imagine that that might suit some right-wingers who hanker after a privatised NHS and would see those companies use a free trade do deal to accomplish exactly that, along with other public services, but leaving the hands of Tory politicians clean. Equally, we'd face demands to admit chlorine-washed chicken and hormone-fed beef and no doubt other delights on which we have not yet focused. Nor are other trade deals consequence-free. India and China, to name but two, would again understandably want additional visas for their citizens. I have no quarrel with that. But the Prime Minister's emphasis on the end of free movement may give some the misleading expression that an end to immigration is what she is offering. It's not. And in the most recent figures, it's actually non-EU immigration which is increasing. Then, not satisfied with the grave red lines misjudgment, tying her own hands, restricting her room for manoeuvre, the Prime Minister added the crass folly of selecting a date, and not just a date, a time for our leaving and to please and reassure her Brexiteers put it on the face of the bill. It was as that self-inflicted deadline approached that some began to say it would be best to leave the European Union at the end of March, giving up our prime negotiating cards and our strength, and work out afterwards what would be in our interests in the future. I don't think I have ever heard anything so criminally irresponsible from any government 
or from the, the supporters of any government. The Prime Minister says people just want it to be over. Of course they do. Heaven knows, I think we probably all share that sentiment. But it's a con. It's perhaps the biggest con of all. If we pass this deal in this House, it won't be over. The really serious stuff hasn't even started. And it's going to go on for years. To guide us, there we have, of course, the political declaration. And we've already heard from the governments of France and Spain how binding they believe its warm words to be. But the point is, it settles nothing. All is to be explored or continued, considered or discussed. Nothing is settled. From the outset, the Prime Minister resisted the idea that this sovereign parliament should have the chance to vote and express its opinion on any deal she might secure. She forcefully resisted the notion of a meaningful vote, and now we have one. She's doing her utmost to make it meaningless by insisting there's only one way for MPs to vote, which is for her deal. The outcome of this series of votes is unpredictable and could well be indecisive. I have seen such a thing happen in this House before. So should there now be a further people's vote? I hear no from most of the benches opposite. But I'm in no doubt. I know infinitely more now about the potential consequences of leaving the European Union than I did in 2016. And I think, having been in the Cabinet for some 11 years, I probably knew a little bit about it before. And I know, too, that what Leave campaigners promised is not on offer, mostly because it was undeliverable. The Honourable Members for Totnes and Bracknell have reminded us that a major medical intervention must be preceded by an assurance that informed consent has been given. Consumer protection law gives a 14-day cooling-off period for people to make sure they know what they're doing. And this time, the very future of our country is at stake. There's been a determined effort to keep people in the dark. Economic assessments of Brexit's impact prepared for ministers were withheld, like the government's legal advice. The real-life full consequences of leaving with no deal, which clearly still attracts some on the benches opposite, are not being fully spelt out. The Chancellor, like the Governor of the Bank of England, publicly accepts that we would be economically better off to stay in the European Union. But he points out, and this is fair, that many who voted leave thought that a price worth paying to recover our sovereignty. But the deal on offer, as the Prime Minister says, the only deal on offer does not recover our sovereignty. It leaves us rule takers from the European Union without any voice in shaping those rules. It represents what may well be the biggest transfer of sovereignty ever proposed by any British government, because this time sovereignty is not being shared, it's being surrendered. None of us can know today just what decisions, what options, if any, will emerge from next Tuesday's votes. The Prime Minister demands, she repeated it today, of all MPs that when we vote, we do so not in any party or personal interest, but for what we honestly believe to be the interests of our country. Mm -hmm. I shall, Mr Speaker, and it will not be for this deal. Thank you. Order.